Hello, this is David Lindsley. After I finished my first video on what Joseph Smith looked like, I gathered a few more facts and comparisons that elaborate upon my earlier findings. This is a follow-up to my previous video and assumes that the viewer has watched the first one. If you have not seen that first video, please stop now and watch it in its entirety so that information and comparisons made in this video will make sense. For years, the assumption has persisted that the daguerreotype we discussed in part one was a photo of this painting of Joseph. Some people believe that another photo of Joseph might have been taken earlier, and this is why newly discovered daguerreotypes of Joseph continue to appear. Let's take a look at the timeline of photography in Joseph's day. Specifically, some speculate that when Joseph Smith went to visit President Van Buren in Philadelphia in 1839, that he had his picture taken while there. While it is factual that Joseph was in Philadelphia, let's see if it was possible that he sat for daguerreotype portrait by looking at a timeline of historical events. In August 1839, Louis Daguerre introduced his camera in France. In early October 1839, the English translation of the Daguerreotype Camera Manual arrived in America. Early adopters of photography now had the schematics and instructions and could either create their own camera or purchase one with accompanying tools for $275. That's over $9,000 in today's money. Quite an investment for any budding photographer. The camera exposure time was about 15 to 20 minutes long using bright outdoor light. Having a person sit motionless for that long was deemed impractical if not impossible. For this reason, very early daguerreotypes are of landscapes and still life images. Joseph arrived in Philadelphia about November 2, 1839, and stayed for only a few days. Daguerreotype technology was still too new at this time to take a portrait. There weren't any daguerreotype studios, and no one was able to take photos of a person. When were photographic portraits able to be taken? In New York City, sometime in mid-January 1840, Henry Fitz, a telescope maker and early daguerreotype adopter photographed himself. His eyes were closed for the required long exposure time in direct sunlight. His selfie is America's first known photographic portrait of a living person. Several months later, in May 1840, the first daguerreotype studio in Philadelphia opened. The daguerreotype process was quickly improved using modified chemicals and larger lenses. In July 1840, this photo of Dorothy Draper, sister of early daguerreotypist John Draper, was taken. It is believed to be the first known photo of a person with their eyes opened. Exposure time, 65 seconds. Over the next few years, more improvements were made and the exposure time to capture a photo was reduced to 10 to 20 seconds. When were daguerreotype portraits available in Nauvoo? When could Joseph have had a photo taken? In late April 1844, Lucian Foster was the first photographer to arrive in Nauvoo, just two months before the prophet's death. Lucian initially stayed in one of the many boarding rooms in the mansion house while he made plans to establish his photographic business in Nauvoo. Joseph's son, Joseph III, was 11 at this time and recalled that his father had a portrait taken by Mr. Foster. This reference is important because it specifically names the photographer and puts the event on the known timeline. Joseph likely sat for daguerreotype in early May 1844. This was the only opportunity that he had to have a photo taken. In June 1844, Lucian Foster was back east working on Joseph's campaign for President of the United States. He was not in Nauvoo again until after the martyrdom. So no, 
Joseph did not have his portrait taken in 1839 while in Philadelphia. He very likely did not have any opportunity to have his photo taken until Lucian Foster and all his equipment arrived in Nauvoo. Part one of my prior video addressed the assumption that this daguerreotype shown on the right is of this painting. I offered several comparisons and measurements that disprove this theory and show that the daguerreotype is of a person, not the painting. Let's look at a few more comparisons. Let's compare collar styles recorded the many images of Hiram and Joseph. In this painting, Joseph's collar is well above the chin, nearly to his mouth. On all of Sutcliffe Maudsley's drawings of Hiram and Joseph, notice that Hiram's upturned collar only reaches to the bottom of his chin. On Joseph, the collar is always drawn, reaching well above his chin. Here's another example from different drawings. Hiram, below the chin, Joseph, above the chin. This is a consistent clothing style that Joseph preferred. Now let's look at the two photos we examined in the part one video. Hiram, collar is below the chin, barely above his tie, just like the drawings. Joseph, collar is above the chin, nearly to his mouth, also just like the drawings. As documented in Maudsley's drawings and verified in daguerreotypes, Hiram's collars were always below his chin, while Joseph wore his collar high on his cheeks. Preachers in a day wore white ties to distinguish themselves in their profession. This was a forerunner of ministers wearing white collars in modern times. Notice in Maudsley's drawings that Joseph is always wearing a white tie. This indicates that he is a minister. Hiram is drawn here with a dark tie. Looking at the various photos thought to possibly be of Joseph, only one shows the man wearing a white tie. This is another consistency that supports the photo on the right being a copy of the daguerreotype taken of Joseph. As documented in Mosley's drawings and verified in Foster's daguerreotype, Joseph wore a white tie, signifying his status as a minister. The part one video examined facial features in detail, and here is one more comparison to add. On the right is David Heinrich Smith, who was born a few months after Joseph's martyrdom. His heavy eyelids and dark hair are like his mother's, but his eyes are like Joseph. Note his wide, level eyebrows. Let's take a closer look. Notice the shape of Joseph's eyebrows. They are wide and extend quite a distance beyond the eye. David had very similar eyebrows. Here is the shape and spacing between the eyebrows and showing the width of the bridge of the nose. Note the similarities. Now let's compare this photo with David Hiram. Here you can see that the shape and spacing of the eyebrows is different than David's. Now this daguerreotype. The above photo has a much wider nose bridge than David Hiram does, and his eyebrows are very different. Now this one. This grainy photo is more difficult to see, but the brows are not the same. Neither is the width of the nose bridge. Once again, here is Joseph and his son David Hiram. They are very, very similar. Joseph and his son David had very similar features as documented in their photographs. 
The location of the original daguerreotype of Joseph is unknown, or at least not available to the public. What we have are various copies of the original that were made later, often decades later, when the ability to produce a negative and make copies on paper was developed. Let's take a look at the process of copying a daguerreotype. Here are the four photos of Joseph, all copies of the original daguerreotype. But notice how they all seem a little different from each other. There are variations of the outline of the hair, the width and length of the face. Why is that? This is the well-known painting of Joseph that I'll use for this comparison. And I assume that the face is in proper proportion. As I presented in part one, while I don't think the original daguerreotype is of the painting, I do think the painter used that daguerreotype as his reference and therefore painted a really good portrait. Here are grid lines that intersect points of reference on the face. Here is the 1878 Carter photo on the right. Some of the face reference points don't exactly match. Here is the same photo, but corrected or unstretched, if you will. The green rectangles make up a perfect square. The red rectangle shows the change on the photo in order to match the reference points to the painting. This is the distortion that occurred when the copy was made. Let's do the same with the 1879 photo. Here it is with its proportions adjusted to match the painting. The yellow rectangle shows the shift needed to line up the facial reference points. More distortion was in this copy. Here is the Marshall photo, which is the least retouched and most detailed of all the copies we have. And the Marshall photo adjusted. The purple rectangle shows the distortion. And finally, the Library of Congress copy from about 1878. The blue rectangle shows the extreme distortion that was corrected in order to match the facial features to the painting. Why are the copies so distorted? Distortion happens because taking a picture of a daguerreotype is very tricky, especially in the 1800s when photographic tools were less sophisticated than today. The daguerreotype did not produce a negative and there was no practical way to make paper copies for many years. On a daguerreotype, the dark areas are shiny and the light areas are transparent. If you photograph a daguerreotype perfectly perpendicular to the image, you will likely see a negative image, and perhaps yourself, in the mirror-like dark areas. Distortions in the various copies of the daguerreotype are a result of difficulty photographing the shiny original. While creating the discussion above, using grid lines to compare reference points on the face, I noticed something significant about the lower part of the painting and the Marshall photo. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the painting and the adjusted Marshall photo. You can see that the lines through the face match up very well. But notice that the sleeve cuff and top of hand do not match between the two. Neither does the level of the unbuttoned vest. They are both lower on the painting. If we stretch out the photo so that the sleeve cuff matches, the vest opening still does not match. And worse, now the mouth and chin are too low. Here is the painting and photo again with the face lines matching. Looking at the two side by side, we can see that the artist painted the vest, sleeve cuff, and hand too low. This is a significant difference between the two images and provides more proof that the photo is not of the painting. Accurately superimposing the photograph over the painting shows the vest, sleeve, and hand do not align. This shows that the daguerreotype is not a photo of the painting. Why is all this important? Truth stands pure and simple. Confusion and contention 
our divisive and shift attention away from what is really important. We have the benefit of written descriptions, historical drawings, paintings, and even a daguerreotype so that we know very well what Joseph looked like. I believe that Joseph Smith was called of God to be the prophet of the Restoration and fulfilled that role completely. I am committed to honoring him with accurate depictions of him to the best of my ability and sharing that information with others so they too will know Brother Joseph. Thanks for watching. Yes, I'm working on part three, which will be coming soon. For more info and other videos, please visit my website.